Good afternoon, everyone, <clears throat> and welcome to the first um, webinar here at Trades Hall, run for HSRs. Uh, my name's Paul, and I'm also here with uh, Amy Jenkins, our online organiser at Trades Hall, and we're looking forward to this opportunity to take you through our first webinar. I thought we might just start by asking people to tell us where they're, where they're logging in from. So if in the um, chat box, you could write down what suburb or town you're, you're in and let us know whereabouts you're from. So we've got Jason uh, from uh, the RMIT University. Welcome, Jason. We've got a few other people on the line here. You're able to tell us where you're from. I'm Dianne from Melbourne. Welcome, Dianne. All right, well, it's good to see we've got a couple of people from the university sector on board, um, as well as a, a few others. What we might do is we might just kick on straight into the, um, straight into the webinar here. So today we're gonna to cover um, some of the key points from the HSR conference. Um, we're gonna have a brief conversation about the record of consultation pad that we handed out at the HSR conference. And then we're gonna have a chat about an area of consultation that the Act doesn't regulate. So thinking about the HSR conference um, that hopefully most of you guys attended, I'm just wondering if people can remember what were the three elements of consultation um, that we talked about in the keynote speech? So if people can uh, write that in the, the chat box, if they can remember the three elements of consultation, what were they? What's the first thing an employer has to give you if they're going to engage in consultation? Information, notice, documentation. That's correct. The first thing employers have to give you is information. What's the second thing that they need to do? That's right, Deanne. They need to give time for feedback. So they have to give you the opportunity to respond to that information. And what's the last thing that an employer has to do? Any takers? I've just got um, Kieran McFarlane. I'm looking at this off. They need to take your views into account. So the three elements, uh, Jason, I think you're on top of it there. So the three elements that uh, of consultation, are one, there must be the provision of information. So you have to be given 
uh, the relevant information um, about the change or, or whatever it is the employer is seeking to do. Secondly, um, for consultation to occur, you have to be given the opportunity to respond. Um, welcome, Kieran. And finally, um, the decision maker has to take your views into account when making the decision. So those are the, the three common law elements of consultation that we discussed at the HSR conference. And we also discussed how they're encoded within the Act. So the Occupational Health and Safety Act has a, a duty for the employer to consult with employees. That duty is contained in section 35 and 36 of the Act. So section 35 contains the duty and section 36 um, talks about how employees are to be consulted. And as you're probably aware, section 36 lays out those common law elements that people must be given information, that they must be given the opportunity to respond and that the employer is to take that uh, the employee's response into account. Secondly, of course, the Act requires um, to consult with their employer. So section 60 um, requires that a HSR consult with the employer before issuing a PIN. Section 67 requires uh, HSRs to consult with employers before choosing a, a training course. And section 74 um, requires, where possible, for HSRs to consult with their employer before issuing a direction to cease work. So they're the act duties to consult. As, you know, as you're aware, and we discussed at the conference, there's also duties in the regulation. And that's where the, the duty for the employer to consult with you, the HSRs is contained. And the key regulation is regulation 2.1.5, which stipulates how an employer is to involve health and safety representatives in consultation. And again, that regulation goes through those three um, key uh, aspects of consultation contained in the common law that they require uh, the employer to give the HSR information and give it to you before they give the information to the designated work group. They require uh, the employer to provide the HSR with an opportunity to respond to that information. And it requires the employer to take your, your response into account when making their decision. So those are the um, duties to consult that are contained in the Act and in the regulations. We just wanted to share a pro tip with you guys. Some of you may have heard of this database already and some of you may not have. There's a database called Ostly and it's a free database. It's open and accessible to anybody, anywhere. Um, it allows you to find legislation quickly and easily. It has the complete um, record of all Victorian and Commonwealth legislation, as well as every other in terms of the OHS Act and the OHS regs when we're looking for a section quickly. So my, um, yes, our advice is that uh, as a pro tip, if you're on the hunt, for a section of the OHS Act of access to the internet, we would recommend that you use the database. Next, we want to have a, a chat about the record of consultation. So when we were at the um, HSR conference, we handed out little, little pads called records of consultation, which were a, a triplicate pack um, that you could use to uh, when you're in consultations, go through the consultation. We're just going to run a quick little poll now. Amy's going to bring it up on the screen for you. Um, and we'd just like you to um, tell us, have you used the record of consultation pad yet? So it looks like almost everybody has not yet had the opportunity to use the record of consultation pad. Well, uh, hopefully you'll get to use it in the future. I can say the other night I met a HSR down at the Australian Education Union who told me that he left the conference and promptly issued four pins on his employer for failing to consult 
over the previous few weeks around a number of changes. Um, and in the meetings that he subsequently got, he started using that record of consultation pad. So hopefully next time you guys are in a position where the employer is consulting with you or you need to consult with them, um, hopefully those pads are of some use. <clears throat> and now I want to get to the, the guts of, of what I wanted to talk about today. So in the uh, conference, we talked a lot about consultation between HSRs and employers or between employers and employees. And today I want to talk about a, a different aspect of consultation that's not in the OHS Act directly. So as I've said, <clears throat> The Act and the regulations now cover the following consultation relationships. Employer to employees, employer to HSRs, HSRs to employers. So I'm wondering if anyone can tell me what consultation relationship is not in the Act or the regs. Can anyone guess what we're going to be chatting about? Kieran, very quick, HSR and DWG members. That's exactly right. <clears throat> the Act is silent on HSRs and DWG members and how they are able to interact, how they are meant to consult. So the question then is, why should HSRs consult with DWG members? Has anyone got any ideas on why HSRs should be consulting with their DWG members? Yes, so these are all good points. HSRs represent the members of the DWG. As part of that, they, are, they need to ensure that the views of the DWG are known and that DWG members have the opportunity to input into the process. And as Diane points out, DWG members are affected by the changes as well and, and therefore need to be involved in the consultation process. And as Brendan points out, um, HSRs consulting with DWG members is often a, a vital way of sharing information. It's also worth bearing in mind that the principles of health and safety in the OHS Act, Section 4, state that employees are entitled and should be encouraged to be represented in relation to health and safety issues. So just as Kieran pointed out, the Act is very clear that employees are entitled to representation and it's you, the HSRs, who are their representative. So HSRs, as you know, are the elected representatives of the DWG. It's a democratic position. It's not a management position. It's not as it was described, uh, a common misconception was described to us yesterday in our OHS catch-up where one HSR said that um, quite often on, on the shop floor, um, the DWG members felt that the HSR was a bit of a policeman position, they were a bit of a copper and would be telling people off. That's not what the HSR is. It's a democratic position to give workers a voice on health and safety in their workplace. Therefore, it's very important that you consult with the members of your DWG when dealing with health and safety issues, because obviously it's their views that, that you need to represent to the employer. So how can we consult with our DWG members? How do you guys do it when you're going through a, a consultation process with your employer? How do you consult with your members?
So Diane's using local committee meetings, emails and face-to-face -face chat. Kieran's using meetings, email and individual discussions as well. Is everyone else using those same processes, meetings, mass meetings or committee meetings, face-to-face -face chats, internet feedback forums, Jason, that's an interesting one. What are other people using? Ross, you're online. How do you chat with the members of your DWG? Brendan uses local safety meetings. <clears throat> Email and discussion boards from Jason are good for part-time workers who can't always come to meetings. It's exactly right. So the traditional ways of consulting with DWG members tend to be um, things like using the notice board to put up information, um, mass meetings or, or um, committee meetings, uh, in the, the lunchroom over the tea break or, or something like that. Uh, phone calls. Um, some people also use paper petitions or, or paper surveys when they're working with their DWG. There are some newer ways to consult with DWG members, a couple of which have been mentioned today. Um, so there's text messaging. You could use private Facebook groups. There's emails being mentioned already today. Um, there's online surveys that can be done quickly and easily, online voting that can be done quickly and easily, and also online petitions. And I just want to talk through a few of these options with you guys now to um, hopefully expand some of the ways that, that you're able to consult with your DWG members in future. Text messaging. You are going to need everyone's phone number. But you can set up groups in your phone so that you can text everyone at the same time. Just remember, in group text, the conversation can be seen by everybody in the group. And so you just need to make sure that, um, you know, obviously, you're not having private conversations in the group context. Um, for some people, this might be a concern, but most text messaging is not encrypted. Uh, text messages are, are really good to, for getting kind of quick, short, sharp answers out of people. Um, but for longer discussions, obviously, text messages are, are not ideal. Private Facebook groups. So a lot of workplaces are starting to use these. Um, you can establish a private Facebook group and then you can invite your designated work group to be a part of it. They're good for sharing messages and having conversations. Also, it's possible to share documents via the private Facebook group. So one example of this is we have a, a private Facebook group here uh, for our OHS network, HSRs. And when the reg review was on, we shared our draft response to those, those regs. Um, and we got feedback from HSRs in the group to that document. So we were able to share the document via the private Facebook group. And HSRs were able to provide us with comments in the, by writing a comment back to the, the post. Um, and we were able to incorporate that feedback into our submission. So the, the private Facebook group is quite flexible. It allows you to have larger conversations. Um, it also allows you to get feedback on, on documents and information that you can post into the group. Another plus to it is, is you can control who is in the group and who is not in the group. And therefore, you can ensure that only your DWG members are in the Facebook group. Finally, um, everyone does need to be on Facebook. It's, it's not going to work completely if, the, if one or two of your DWG members are not on Facebook. WhatsApp. Uh, again, people would need WhatsApp. Um, however, it is encrypted, so your conversations are private if that's of concern to you. It allows one-on-one -on -one and group conversations, a bit like text messaging. It also lets you know if your message has been read. So it, it lets you know if uh, the people in the group have had the opportunity to, to read your message. And so it, it makes you aware of whether the information is getting to your, your audience or not. Again, remember group conversations are visible to the whole group. 
and something like WhatsApp, choose your data, but not your texting bills. Um, I put this one in here because my family and I, and we all use a WhatsApp in order to, yeah, I'm one of five um, children. So there's seven of us in the family, plus all the partners and grandchildren and that kind of stuff. Um, and the WhatsApp has proved a really good way to be able to organize um, the family as a group to, to, you know, we're organizing Christmas over WhatsApp basically. So it's good for organizing people for events and, and that kind of stuff as a group. Email. Um, it's been mentioned a few times, but email is, is a, a good way of sharing information and getting feedback from people. It can sometimes get a bit confusing though. So once you get those long email chains going with lots of different responses piling in, it can get a bit overwhelming. Also, you need to understand with email that open rates can vary. Not everybody reads every email that they get. Some suggestions we've got are an online system um, that will let you load in people's email addresses um, and then it will actually tell you whether people opened their um, email or not. Um, and that'll give you a good check about which person in your DWG is up to speed on, on the issue that you're talking about. So Kieran has said that surveys are gold. Um, we agree. Uh, our, there's many free online survey tools out there. Free versions generally have a few limitations. They're not as good as the paid versions, but it, they will suffice for a, a workplace IHS survey, particularly if your DWG is, is comprised of well of less than 100 people. Um, it allows you to share a link to the survey through email, text, Facebook, so you're able to distribute it through your normal communication channels. And we would recommend um, two uh, free online survey applications, Typeform and SurveyMonkey. All the surveys that we do here at um, the OHS unit, we tend to use Typeform. Um, however, we've also used SurveyMonkey and both platforms um, will help you uh, create a short survey for your DWG members to do, which will include them um, in the, the consultation that you're going through. Next is online voting. So sometimes you're going to need your DWG to make a, a decision on an issue or, or something like that. And the online voting um, is a really simple way of just letting everybody vote on one question. It can be yes, it can be no. It can also be multiple choice. The main, you know, unlike the surveys, which can have lots of questions with various kinds of questions, online voting is just about asking one question and getting a response to it. We recommend uh, Poll Maker or Doodle Poll. Both of them have free, um, free versions available through the internet. Um, and we've used them, we sometimes use them internally to make decisions here at Trades Hall. Um, and they're, they're very good for just getting a fairly quick response um, from the DWG on a single key question. <laughs> Finally, you might also want to have a think about um, online petitions and, and the role they can play for, for your DWG. So here at Trades Hall, we created an online petition platform to help workers win better workplaces. Here at the OHS unit, we've used it in, in several campaigns. We used it in an injured worker campaign earlier on this year. We've used it to highlight um, the dangers around imported asbestos. And our megaphone um, petition platform We'll let you print the petition, uh, print it out with all the signatures so you can take it to your employer if um, that's part of the, you know, you're able to say, well, everybody here doesn't agree with your new safety measure and they've signed this petition calling on, on you to change it. Um, and you can print that out and, and take it to the employer as proof. Um, Megaphone is union owned. It's owned by Trades Hall and we are committed to protecting your data. Some of the other online petition platforms, um, they might be not-for-profit organisations, but they are still known to sell data. So if you're concerned about data security and, and making sure that um, your DWG members' data is not going to be sold for profit, 
um, then we encourage you to use the Megaphone platform where union data stays union data and is not on sold at all. Um, <clears throat> Megaphone is, is really quick and really simple. It's at www.megaphone.org.au and you're able to start your own petition there and it, it only takes a few minutes to get the petition up and running. So what are the benefits <clears throat> to consultation with your DWG? Well, firstly, many minds are often better than just one. So people's DWGs tend to cover a variety of different jobs and roles within the DWG. And um, there are many workplaces where HSRs are the HSR for the DWG, but may not be familiar exactly with every single job that the, that's involved in the DWG. And so therefore it's essential that HSRs are liaising with the people doing the actual work so that they can ensure that, that those people's views on, on safety are, are then relayed to the employer. It also involves the DWG in the issues that affect them. The whole point of consultation, that there's nothing about us without us, is a principle that applies also to the, the employees in the DWG. It's vitally important that if the employer is going to be changing anything that affects the safety of your DWG members, that they are then involved in the discussion around that issue. It also gives you the confidence that you are accurately representing the views of your DWG. It means that you can look your boss in the eye and say, look, this is what we in the DWG think about that change that you are making. Finally, we also view it as a a display of strength in numbers and it helps the employer understand that you are not just one annoying HSR, it's actually the whole DWG that's involved in the issue. So sometimes we know that union delegates and also HSRs, um, there tends to be a, a little bit of a feeling that, that um, a HSR has a bit of a target on their back sometimes or stuck their head above the parapet, whichever metaphor you would like to use. But the, from the employer's point of view, what it can often feel like is here's one person who keeps walking into my office complaining about health and safety um, and their kind of negative views adhere to that one person. Whereas when an employer um, feels like everybody in the DWG has a problem and the HSR is merely relaying the message, it actually works to protect the HSR. Because rather than the negative views adhering to the, you know, the, the employer thinking, well, I don't like that HSR, they're always walking here with problems. The employer is confronted with the fact that all the people in the DWG, 10 of them, 20 of them, 30 of them, however many, all of them have this issue and I need to sort it out. And the HSR is my best way to get that done because the HSR is the person representing their views and has the insight into what kind of solutions are going to work for the DWG. So going through good consultation processes and going through doing things like surveys and petitions um, and those little polls where you can walk into the, the employer's office and say, well, look, we've gone through a good process. We've, we've done a little survey or, or I've asked them, do they agree or not? And they say they don't agree and here's the poll result. Um, that, that helps the employer grasp the idea that actually it's the whole DWG that's got a bit of an issue with, with this thing I'm trying to change or, or the, new, the new machine I brought in or, or whatever the issue is. So what we'd like to do now, um, and we're coming towards the end of the webinar, is we'd like to work with you guys through a scenario. So Mary is an HSR and she works at the Schweppes bottling plant on the machines. She's a day shift HSR and she turns up to work on Monday to discover that her employer has purchased a new machine and wants to install it next week. The employer gives Mary the specifications for the machine and the operating procedures for the machine. Mary thinks that there is an issue with the guarding, but it is a machine that she is not trained on. I should also point out that Mary's DEWG contains a number of part-time and casual staff members who are not guaranteed to be in the workplace all day, every day, the same way she is. So what should Mary do? What are some ideas for how Mary can work through this problem with her DWG using some of those tools we've just suggested to you?
Has anyone got any ideas? What's the first thing Mary could do? Yes, so the first thing that Mary can do, is she can speak to the members um, and she can try and contact the others by text. She could also ask for more information. Um, as Diane's pointed out, she could email Facebook or WhatsApp her contacts describing the, the changes and her concerns. What could she do about the fact that it's a machine that she's not trained on, that she doesn't understand? Yep, so the supplier needs to supply worker training. Get some specialist advice, that's good. She could use 581F to get a specialist involved. Exactly, Jason. Mary could approach the people who are trained on the machine and she could get some feedback from those people. So if Mary's, she's spoken to the people who are trained on the machine and they've given her some feedback, they also think there's a guarding issue. Um, what else can she do? That's correct, Deanne. Um, she could talk to her employer about, well, you're failing to consult, so we need to set up some good consultation processes um, before you buy this new piece of equipment um, and probably at that time she needs to raise the issue around the garden. Kieran, great point. Not only should she just raise the issue, she needs to find out what the solutions are. Where can Mary go to find out what the solutions are? Yep, she can go to experts or the manufacturer. She can go to other workplaces or areas with the same piece of her equipment. Her union, that's a good point. Um, her boss or the manufacturer or supplier could also have some ideas, that's correct. WorkSafe would be another option. Speaking to WorkSafe to see what kind of guarding they recommend for that particular machine. All right, so in this scenario where we've got to is that Mary should talk to um, her DWG and have good conversations with the people who work on on the, the machine that's been, um, on the kind of machine that's been installed. Um, we've also ascertained that, that Mary should not just be consulting with her DWG, but she needs to be going um, to seek some outside assistance on what what some good solutions are to the, the guarding problem. Um, so some recommendations there were um, experts, the manufacturer, um, other workplaces that use the same machinery, her union, if she's got one, um, her employer, the manufacturer and supplier, and also WorkSafe. But the key part of it is that first initial consultation that she runs with her DWG around, this is what the employer is looking to do. What do we think about it? So. You're all spot on where the first thing that she needs to do is talk with her DWG about the issue. So, ah, that's a good question. What should Mary do if she feels there is an issue, but her DWG doesn't? Can she still press the issue with the employer? Um, yes, Mary is still able to uh, press the issue with her employer if she feels like she has to, um, <clears throat> pardon me. However, it might be a good opportunity for Mary to use her power to get in a, a relevant expert um, to check it out. So if her DWG is thinking, oh, it doesn't sound like much of a problem to us, um, 
Mary is still entitled to get it, that view double checked and to get a, a specialist opinion on, on the guarding um, and then be able to provide that opinion to her DWG. So under, in your act, under the HSR powers, section 58, get the assistance of any person. So my answer to Jason's questions would be, um, if the DWG thinks it's not much of an issue, but Mary is still concerned about it, um, one thing she might look to do is to um, seek the assistance of someone who knows about guarding on machines. And if that person doesn't agree with the DWG, then I think Mary is able to provide that information back to her DWG to say, well, look, we got this in specialist in, um, and this is their opinion. So who pays for the specialist is a follow-up question from Brendan. Um, it's going to depend on where the specialist comes from. So um, WorkSafe has a number of hygienists, um, specialist hygienists who are experts in health and safety. Um, quite often when their inspectors um, have a, a tough question in a workplace, they call in the hygienists. And sometimes hygienists have gone out to assist HSRs in workplaces as well. So if you're going to access a WorkSafe inspector or a WorkSafe hygienist, then um, that's free because WorkSafe pays for it. Um, another specialist, if you're in a union, sometimes unions have OHS officers or, or officials who are REO trained. Um, so they've gone through um, OHS training and they're able to assist HSRs with problems like this. So in that case, again, um, that's free um, because the union is paying for that person's time. Um, if you're gonna go outside those two and you're gonna go look to try and get um, an independent contractor of some kind in to, to review the health and safety, um, then it's necessary to have a conversation with the employer about paying for the specialist. So, Quite often, um, when issues like this come up, um, there is a discussion about getting it reviewed by an independent OHS consultant. Um, and then there's uh, a bit of argy-bargy about it, but quite often um, employers um, will pay for someone to come in and do checks of this kind um, as part of their um, due process. Trades Hall also has a list of um, OHS consultants who have signed on to our principles about making sure that employee safety is the highest priority, that HSRs are always consulted. And so we have a list of preferred providers in this area that we can make available to you guys. And we might um, email out to you uh, sometime this afternoon following the webinar. Are there any other questions arising out of the scenario? No questions from Kieran. All right, well, we've come to the end of our webinar. I'd like to thank you for being a part of our first ever webinar series. There's Amy, hello, Amy. What we'll do now is we'll um, share with you the link to the presentation that we just went through so you're able to download it for your own use. We'll also post that link up um, on our website so that people have it. And I'll, I'll just do that now for you. Um, we'd really like to thank you all for being a part of our first ever webinar here at the OHS unit Trades Hall. We're also, um, there's a, a short survey at the end of the, of the webinar here. And we'd love for you to be able to take that survey to help uh, us improve on our webinars. Let us know what worked, what didn't, and if you've got any suggestions for what we can do next time to, to really make it a more engaging experience for you guys. Once again, we'd just like to thank you all for like to thank you all for attending. And a final reminder that on the 14th of December, we'll be having a Christmas party um, for OHS, um, for people interested in OHS, HSRs. We'll be trying to get along some union OHS officers and some injured workers. 
Um, so it will be, that'll be here at Trades Hall on Wednesday, the 14th of December. And we'd love to see you all here that evening. All right, that's bye from us now. And we'd like to thank you for attending and we'll see you next time. Goodbye.